I grew up in a quiet suburb of Philadelphia, the third of four daughters, and uh, my dad was an eminent physician. After listening to a missionary speak on the suffering of, China, of the Chinese in the spring of 1949, it really influenced my senior speech, and it turned into a plea for the people of that country. Perhaps I could be a missionary. I didn't even know what a missionary did at that time. But my parents were alarmed, and my passion was uh, a, a concern to them. And so they tried to persuade me in other directions, but I was determined. In fact, I remember ending a conversation with my dad saying, and don't be surprised if I marry a Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> they breathed a sigh of relief when Mao closed the um, China with the bamboo curtain in 1949. My father was born in Seattle and had a summer place on Bainbridge Island. He came east to study medicine, met and married my mother, and became professor of neurology and neurosurgery. It was the early 1940s, and during World War II, he was determined that his four girls not become debutante butterflies, but be familiar with mechanics and how to handle a gun, <laughs> adept at raising a victory garden, canning, raising chickens, and um, pigs even. But after the war, Dad established a clinic for the treatment of cerebral palsy patients. And at that time, there was no money for college. So when I graduated, he encouraged me to become his secretary at his clinic. So working there, I learned a lot about medicine and rehabilitation <laughs> techniques, and even how to operate a switchboard. By 1953, though, I was ready for a change. And I applied to be a service rep for the Bell Telephone Company of Pennsylvania. And after a while, I was training service representatives and eventually landed an upper management position, which was unusual for women at that time. As a public relations person, I gave talks and lectures to many organizations, among them a group of medical wives that included Mrs. George Henney, an old family friend. Dr. Henney was a colleague of my dad's at Temple University. Dr. and Mrs. Henney asked me to meet their son, David, who came to Philadelphia for Christmas with his four small children. Mrs. Henney said, David has an independent telephone company on Whidbey Island. <laughs> Well, we in Bell Management knew that independence needed a lot of help. <laughs> so I agreed to a blind date and a chance to give David information. Our blind date was thanks to tickets that Mrs. Henney had got for a Christmas oratorio in New York. So we were on a train from Philadelphia to New York and talked nothing but telephones. <laughs> I was trying to bring David's telephone company up to snuff. But <laughs> during our conversation, I realized that David could manage a telephone company better than Bill. So my, <laughs> my dream was to marry a man who was willing to starve for an ideal. It was the 60s, and I knew that anyone was willing to starve for an ideal, they'd never starve. So <laughs> David seemed to be that man, and I fell in love. And we were married in, the, in April of 1965. David was a divorced parent with four children, ages two, four, seven, and eight, and whose wife had decided that her life would be better with a handsome mountaineer. But I was not daunted, <laughs> having never been married. <laughs> I moved into David's 
um, old farmhouse on Useless Bay, sure that I could handle all the challenges that arose. I was a devoted stepmother for eight years, and David um, and I were a real team. I set up the business office and worked there, and David handled everything else in the company. Our home on Whidbey was so similar to our summer place our family had in Maryland on the eastern shore, and also my father's place on Bainbridge Island. All seemed to have a western view. So gardening and raising vegetables, and soon there were seven beautiful children <laughs> and two horses. For 36 years, my creative husband enlarged and beautified the place, so there were always workmen, carpenters, bulldozers, landscapers. <laughs> They're all crawling around, and this included a custom-made addition for David's parents, who moved from Philadelphia in 1982 and lived with us for 18 years until they went to their reward. <clears throat> for many years, business people in communications from all over the country offered handsome sums to buy Whidbey Telecom. David refused them all. What would he do but buy another telephone company? <laughs> and there was none in the whole United States that had such a perfect location and an opportunity to offer excellence in service. His refusals led to stealth attempts to put us out of business. There were strikes, PUD threats, and later some federal attempts. At the same time, my stepchildren went to live with their mother. David and I had three children by that time, as I mentioned, George, Julia, and Mark but we were devastated with the loss of the other four. Our marriage went through some ups and downs, too. Do you remember if you dialed a wrong number, you would hear a recording that said, I'm sorry, but the number you have called is not in service at this time. If you need assistance, please stay on the line and an operator will answer. That was the voice of David. I used to misdial it on purpose so I could hear him say, I'm sorry, but then I'd <laughs> hang up. <laughs> In the midst of all this craziness, I could see only one resort, and I threw up my hands and I said, God, if you are real, you can have this whole mess because I can't handle it. And a blanket of peace just covered me. And although the circumstances didn't change, something inside of me did, and I was able to cope. These uh, circumstances finally abated and as a result of a vindicating court decision, the Whidbey Telephone Company was awarded a fair amount of money enabling it to continue business and to expand our facilities. Thanks to a telephone convention in Hawaii with an add-on tour to China, I finally made it there in 1982. <laughs> David was only interested in following the overhead wires <laughs> that uh, promised to lead to a, a central office because he wanted to visit it. But my heart was for the Chinese people. And so I was able to go to China six times and we sponsored 14 dedicated students who are a real example of true dedication to our American system, and I'm very proud of them. I even became the mother of the bride <laughs> to one couple, <laughs> standing in for the bride's mother who had died during the Cultural Revolution. So that kind of um, confirmed the threat I'd made to my dad. <laughs> 
through all these years, growth, progress, and has continued at Whidbey Telephone Company. We were the first in the United States to have 100% buried local lines, and the first to have internet west of the Rockies before AOL and Microsoft. <laughs> and in 2009, Whidbey Telecom was given an award for outstanding service by the Washington Independent Telephone Association. Since David died in 2001, and I sat in his chair for about two years, um, I have taken on the role of being behind the scenes uh, as chairman of the board, providing only suggestions and encouragement to George and Julia as this cyber world becomes more their realm than mine. Mark lives nearby, and he's caught the joy of service to others. And I delight in the reality that there is a greater source that comprehends all these things and really brings strength, thanksgiving, and joy to my life. Thank you.